Robin, thank yeah. you very much for having me. It's great to have you here. Yeah. Um, we have, well you say that, you haven't listened to the show, we have a traditional first question for first time guests. Mm -hmm. Robin, were you a weird kid? Yes, I was, I was a bit of a loner and a bit of an odd one out. Okay. I was the uh, only person at high school who was a pacifist and refused to stand for the national anthem and turned my back on Anzac Day. And Have you spoken to David Holmgren about this? No, we haven't talked much about that. Because he has talked about lots of other things. Yeah, sure. Because <laughs> I asked him the same question as well, and he has a similar story mm. about his socialist parents and being anti-war and it being a big deal when he was in high school. Well, my parents weren't anti-war. That I was see. a wonderful epiphany for me. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, my parents were actually in the Salvation Army, so mm -hmm. I used to get ragged about that at school. So that, in a way, sort of gave me the courage to be different. Gotcha. Um, and uh, like there's a lot that I don't subscribe to in the Salvation Army or uh, Christian religions per se, but uh, certainly, you know, the teachings of, you know, of, 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 of attributed to Jesus, I've got no problems with them. Uh, but um, one of the things that uh, I always appreciated about my parents was they were very practical mm -hmm. Christians and they believed that they needed to contribute to uh, something bigger than themselves and uh, they had a very strong social conscience. I see. Mm. So do you, would you say that stuff came first or are there parts of it that you rebelled against there? Did you go from anti-war to thinking, do you know what, I'm going to be um, the opposite of my parents, I'm going to be a wealthy industrialist. Did you go through a phase mm, like that? No, no, I think my first big uh, sort of out of the box thing was actually when I was 12 years old and the Sydney Symphony Orchestra was coming to our little country town and uh, the whole of the high school was invited and they had uh, four places for kids from the public school and so they asked who learns music and I put my hands up I was learning piano and so the teacher said well these are some of the uh, this is some of the music that they'll be playing you and they played the ride of the Valkyrie and that just transported me to another realm and I discovered classical music and everybody thought I was so weird and uh, but I loved the Beatles so I used to make my own t-shirts um, Beatles and Beethoven forever Elvis never that's great <laughs> I love it that's still kind of it's still current now but, <laughs> <laughs> but um, what was one of the big turning points for me was when I was about 15 or 16 I joined the debating club at high school and uh, the teacher who was facilitating it sort of gave us a topic to pull out of a hat. We had to pull a topic out of a hat to give a five minute talk at the next meeting. The one I pulled out was should we be fighting in Vietnam and of course we should, you know, that was the pervading um, uh, thought in my little country redneck town. Where was and this? Which town? In Burrell. Okay, right. And um, of course at home, you know, we had the In Burrell Times, we had the Salvation Army uh, rag, and my parents subscribed to the Reader's Digest. So the Reader's Digest was about my sole source of information. And so I prepared this talk and gave it about why we should be fighting in Vietnam and Reds Under the Bed and Yellow Peril and all that stuff and at the end the teacher said um, well Robin you spoke very well you had an introduction a conclusion you know your middle um, but the content what was your source of information and I went oh the Reader's Digest sir and he went ah. Ah. He said, I'd like you to go back and read all that information again and separate out the facts from the opinions and then tell me what you think. And so I read every article again, separated the two out and I became a full on pacifist. Amazing. Yeah. So And he taught that taught me the art of critical thinking. That's really cool. Mm. And yeah, that the teacher was a crypto pacifist himself then? Yeah, he was a bit of a lefty. He, he yeah. knew he he knew <laughs> He got your number and he's like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, I never took anything at face value ever again. Gotcha. Mm. So
So growing up uh, in, you know, in a rural context, uh, did you kind of think you'd end up with this sort of magnificent teaching facility? I mean, did you guys grow vegetables and things growing up? Yes, mum, folks both grew up on dairy farms during the Depression years. And um, they, you know, they, they didn't... Um, they didn't have much money. We had a quarter acre block in Inverell, but we grew most of our vegetables. We had lots of fruit trees. We had chickens, ducks, a couple of hives of bees. We had a milking goat that we tethered out to mow the neighbors' lawns. Uh, and I think it was only when I was about 13 or 14, we actually got sewage connected to that mm -hmm. part of town. So up until then, the whole extended family had to survive on a um, uh, a 2,000 gallon water tank. Right. So we sort of grew up with a quarter of a cup of water to brush our teeth and uh, a quarter of water, that's two pints, about a litre, to wash our hair once a week and and it was all waste not want not and um, lots of preserving food. We'd go out to orchards in season and buy, you know, um, harvest and bring home boxes full of stone fruits and bottle them for the rest of the year. And, uh, so I really appreciate having grown up in such a resourceful, yeah. productive environment. Mm. We were chatting over lunch that um, you've had uh, students of yours in other countries uh, in Asia, so in, in Bali and, and India and so on, when you are out there teaching permaculture. Mm come up and, and thank you for revitalizing in their own minds the, the traditional farming practices of their own family. So mm. you said that they were mm. more proud of, they're, they're proud of their fathers again now, the ones that refused yeah. to use the Monsanto seeds and yeah. so on. And it's just interesting that um, we, whatever that means, do in fact have a version of that. I mean, you mm. just described 80% mm. um, of what permaculture homesteading is and you were just doing yeah. it as normal. It's, it's yeah. you know, conserving resources and, mm. and all of that kind of stuff. Yep. Yeah. And everything would be mended and we'd make and bake it ourselves and you know, yeah. sort of learnt to sew on an old treadle machine. We sewed our own clothes, I think. Um, I'm trying to remember when I had my first bought new piece of clothing. I think it was an um, it was a uh, it was a warm winter coat when I was about mm, maybe 12 or 13 years old. That was the first time I had a new store bought wow. uh, piece of clothing. Everything else was either homemade um, or. Uh, hand-me-downs from cousins and <laughs> so was I mean it's just kind of fascinating that uh, let me describe it did you go from activism once you kind of found your anti-war position did mm. that kind of define the sort of stuff you wanted to do with your life and then it was a question of finding where that attitude fits into the world I mean take us from being that um, uh, anti-war kid in high school to when you first ever heard of permaculture Oh, well, that was a very long journey and a lot of things sort of led on the way. Uh, from, I, I felt like a fish out of water in, mm -hmm. in Burrell. I couldn't wait to get out of that place. And um, I, once I started sort of getting my own pocket money and becoming more aware of the world, I used to get, uh, you know, sometimes buy Life magazine and there were sort of big spreads on Woodstock um, mm -hmm. Festival and... Um, things like that and I really liked music that had a message in it and so the music of the 60s that was actually saying something uh, that was you know my I, I was just really passionate about music uh, I wanted to actually make my career in music but I failed maths in my HSC so I couldn't go to Sydney Uni to study music composition and become a film score composer gotcha. uh, <laughs> uh, so I sort of found um, found an old guitar and uh, repaired it and taught myself to play and started doing folk clubs and so on and so you know the folk music of Seeger and Dylan and uh, Joan Baez and that was all sort of part of that early influence I moved down to Sydney when I finished high school and soon started to connect up with the um, counterculture movement sure. down there and the old hippie movement and um, 
and uh, you know we were always talking about you know sort of going back to the land and going back to a more natural life away from the city um, then in uh, 72 I went overseas for five years and uh, arriving in Bali so we sort of island hopped through Indonesia and uh, I was with a German boyfriend and then we flew over to Germany but uh, that first sort of other culture experience was really profound mm -hmm. and like Kuta those days was still a small fishing village there were uh, three houses that uh, had some rooms to house um, you know travelers mm -hmm. and uh, there was one little pancake shop on the road down to the beach and uh, it was uh, what really fascinated me was the whole village culture and how people grew their food and the different cuisines of the countries that we went through in Southeast Asia and then uh, living in Germany for three and a half years um, it was a wonderful time to be there because I was living in a small village um, about 30 kilometers out of Munich and surrounded by farm old farmers that were still farming traditionally. The only thing they imported onto their farm was a diesel to put in mm -hmm. their tractor but they were still doing the traditional crop rotations. They um, were you know, composting their uh, animal manures and uh, the, you know, the litter from the stables and so on to fertilize their fields. I uh, was fascinated by all the wildflowers and then realized one day that some of them looked familiar and that they, they were it was chamomile that was growing wild mm. it wasn't just a picture on a tea bag yeah, in Australia yeah. Yeah. and uh, I uh, spent a lot of time um, discovering the wild foods there and I mean by my third summer I was collecting over 200 medicinal herbs from the wild got to know all the wild mushrooms that were edible and um, I spent I learnt the local dialect so I could talk with the old farmers wives and find out about their traditional food storage systems and and uh, I and that together with sort of what I'd seen in my travels uh, I started to develop this idea so this was during the 70s um, that I'd love to have some land and develop it as a, like a botanical gardens of useful plants that are put together in a similar way to how you find them in nature because you know I sort of noticed that there were these definite associations and niches and, and, and so forth that things grew in and so I wanted to recreate something like that as a, as a, as a farm. And, uh, Three German winters was enough and so we spent a year traveling back to Australia and uh, there were a number of epiphanies uh, in that journey and especially one in South India where this um, student took us to his village uh, and uh, then took us around the back of the village and introduced us to the, uh, an untouchable that, that worked for his, on his grandmother's farm. And this untouchable was living in this little tiny thatch hut and had maybe a metre or so width of yard around the hut, the fence, and that little tiny strip around the hut was absolutely packed full of food plants. And I just looked at that and I went, wow, why is anybody hungry on the planet when you can grow so much food in such a small space? And another important thing also on that journey was uh, just seeing some of the appalling behavior of European travelers. <laughs> and um, I sort of decided that I would never travel again unless I had something meaningful to contribute. And I was invited. Uh, we came back to Australia um, sort of around August uh, 77. And not long after that, there was an organic festival at Upper Colo. Mm -hmm. And I thought, a great way to reconnect with what's happening in Oz. I'd been away for five years. And one of the speakers there was Bill Mollison, promoting the soon-to-be-published Permaculture One book. Wow. 
and it was really exciting hearing Bill talk because he was talking about all this stuff I was dreaming about and it had a name and a methodology and it connected in all these other things that I was interested in. So you were waiting at the edge of the stage, um, Mr. Mellison, once, once he was no, done? No, I was hanging out for the book to be yeah, released. Sure. And, yeah, sure. Uh, then I found out about the Permaculture magazine and uh, the uh, Permaculture Journal and subscribed to that. And um, We bought land on the mid-north coast, uh, sort of halfway between here and Sydney. And I set up a herb farm there and did some organic market gardening and, you know, the whole back to the land thing. We were starting from scratch, so I was building dams, planting orchards, you know, animals, um, had my children and uh, started working with the local community and uh, things that sort of bring the community together and organising local markets and uh, so on. And um, after six years there, uh, the relationship broke down and um, I moved on to a community down the road for a while and uh, then I uh, did the PDC in late 83. It was the first women's PDC. With, who was that with? That was with um, Judy Thurling and Susie Edwards and Lee Harrison okay. up in the Tweed. And uh, then I moved to Sydney because I felt it was really important to get permaculture in the city. Sure. And I'd been, you know, living up on the mid-north coast. There were a lot of new settlers sort of moving from the city up to the country with great ideals, but their dreams were turning into big nightmares uh, because they just didn't have the knowledge and skills to make it work. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to, uh, you know, get permaculture going in the city to reach people before they moved out to the country so they'd have a better chance of making a good go of it uh, and also because you know the city itself needs permaculture yes so um, and it was down there that I really connected uh, with Bill when he was teaching a course uh, in 1984 at um, the university down there and um, the convener of the course invited me to her place to have dinner with Bill one night and uh, he really encouraged me to start teaching because I, you know, I had a wealth of experience yep. that I could bring into it and uh, he sort of became my mentor then over the next 10 years mm. and we did a lot of work together and we taught the first permaculture course in India together and Oh really? Yeah. There's some yeah. videos of um, Bill's anecdotes being legendary. There are some videos of uh, him on YouTube telling yeah. stories from uh, from that piece. From, that from must there, have been yeah. yeah, and uh, yeah, you'll find a few references in the um, Travels and Dream book too. Oh yeah, so, cool. Yeah, got a couple of mentions in there. Nice one. Mm. So um, you, could, I mean, you'd seen him speak beforehand, and you connected up with him once you got to Sydney. But when you decided to head down there after your PDC, was it like I'm actually going to? I really am going to teach this, and it was Bill that gave you the complete encouragement you needed. But you'd already kind of made that decision yourself. Yeah, yeah. and uh, um, yes, it's. On, I, I love communicating, and I'd already been giving lots of little workshops over the years on growing herbs and organic gardening and companion planting and all that sort of stuff uh, and it was yeah Bill just really yeah, said look yeah. yeah go for it excellent mm. well because um, we you gave us a brief tour of the um, the sort of education center building here it's magnificent there's a course mm. going on which we'll talk about in a second uh, there's a course going on at the moment uh, but what was it about permaculture, given that you have a lot of the skills already, um, either you'd grown up with them or you'd encountered them in your travels and then through your various businesses, market gardening and herbs and so on. Mm. Was it permaculture's um, systematic approach? What was it that made you think, you know what, this is the way that I'm going to um, frame a lot of my teaching? Uh it was the interconnectedness of everything, mm. it's the way everything, the relationships, the interrelationships, the way um, you know buildings support the garden, gardens support the building, and how everything gets integrated. And having the incredible tools of the uh, principles to guide one's thinking and decision making and, and design. 
Excellent. Mm. Yeah, that's true. That's a really good. That is probably its principal mm. value because if mm. you can kind of get that correct, the other pieces can drop away. Like, you know, putting. Uh, I mean, all the other bits are out there, but mm. they're all separated and yeah. segregated. And I think that's the magic of permaculture is how it actually pulls it all together into a consciously designed system. Mm. Yeah, that's really nice. Speaking of consciously designed systems, I mean, let's go from. Uh, again, that was a really good, uh, really good effort of kind of covering off so many years in, in a few minutes. How do you mm. get from teaching in Sydney to this magnificent place? Well, <laughs> you can take the girl out of the bush, but you can't take the bush out of the girl. Uh, I'm not a city person, but um, I uh, made a commitment to stay in Sydney until I had produced at least two teachers. Uh, that were committed to staying in the city mm -hmm. and uh, during that time I also took on the uh, editing of the International Permaculture Journal from Terry White and did sort of umpteen other things but um, by uh, sort of mid-1988 I was starting to get a couple of other teachers on board like uh, Rosemary Morrow and uh, Bronwyn Rice and um, Jill Beck and uh, okay you know there's enough people now to keep it going so I just said hey guys um, early 89 next year I'm off you've got six months warning and uh, I moved up to northern New South Wales I wanted to sort of find my perfect patch and uh, create a permaculture education center uh, where you know, the, we've got a living classroom as well as an indoor classroom. But um, I just didn't want it to be in isolation. Mm -hmm. I wanted it to be somehow in integrated with some form of sustainable human settlement and um, and in and you know wider community. Uh, so I was based in Lismore for quite a few years, and we moved the journal office there. I train people in to take on my work there and I uh, started looking for my patch um, actually yeah it's and it's this is a nice little story I'll Go keep it, it as short no, as no, I can you take all the time um, you want. in Lismore I was trying to finish finish off a journal it was the uh, old days where you still had to sort of get your photos bromided and had to send down the cut and paste to mm -hmm. Sydney for printing uh, it was pre-digital and uh, there was this quarter page blank and it was 2am in the morning <laughs> and I had to get that into the mail first thing in the morning and I went oh what am I going to do with this have I got a graphic I can stick in there and nothing really suitable and I went I know I'm just going to put my little rave in what I'm looking for and uh, I did that and the journal came out it was going to the newsstands those days and a few days after it came out I got a phone call from a farmer here in Nimbin and he said oh I read your thing your rave there with interest and then I saw it was a local number he said I'm getting a uh, 50 odd acres of land rezoned for rural residential and I'm not comfortable with a standard subdivision um, would you like to come out and have a look at it and you know, so, um, see what a permaculture pr approach would be and uh, the Community Title Act had just come in in New mm -hmm. South Wales and I'd been a part of the Rural Resettlement Task Force multiple occupancy movement in the late 70s, early 80s and we'd lobbied state government to get this form of land sure. tenure happening. And uh, so I explained that to him, looked at the land and so uh, he uh, engaged me to design Jalambar as uh, New South Wales' first rural community title and uh, I was still looking for my perfect patch around and I had a you know a list of absolute uh, non-negotiable uh, factors and then I had the negotiable factors one of the non-negotiable ones was it had to be within preferably walking distance definitely comfortable cycling distance 
from a town centre or a well-serviced village. And uh, so um, John Hunter phoned me up one day and says, oh, that's five acres next to Jalambar on the village site. Would you be interested in buying that for your permaculture centre? And I'll keep talking. Mm. <laughs> and so that's how I came to get this piece of land here. Did you know when you walked onto it? Did you come and have a look? When, uh, well, like I'd been like? walking across it for so two long. years, designing Jalamba. Yeah, okay. So I knew it well. And I had been offered another piece of land by somebody else for the same price over the other side of Nimbin, but there were issues with it. Um, but this one just ticked all the boxes for me. Mm. And how did it come to have this name? What does that mean? Uh, well, I wanted a name with many. And uh, there was a wonderful Aboriginal man uh, who'd uh, done a PDC with me back in 89, uh, Burry Jerome, and uh, he was then living just out of Nimbin on a community, and I saw Burry uptown, I said, Burry, I've got this piece of land down there, I said, I'd like a real name, it'd be nice to have a Bunjalung name if it's appropriate. But. Um, I know I, I don't feel comfortable to just go through a dictionary and sure. pluck something out. And he went, no, 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 no. Mm. He said, there's a process. He said, but I'll have to see the place first and know more about what we want to do there. So he came down and we went for a walk around. It was just a bare cow pasture with three railway carriages sitting in the middle. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I walked around and explained what I was going to be doing and growing and creating and making and... Um, and we sat down and had a cuppa and he says, well, I can't give you the name, but I'll go and see the people who can. And uh, three days later he came back. He'd travelled all the way up to Tabulum, which is about 300 kilometres away, to visit Uncle Eric Walker, who was the senior law keeper and uh, elder of the Bundjalung Nation. And he came back and he said, platypus. Uh, there's two Bunjalung names um, for platypus. There's Maramaru and there's Janba. And he gave me a story uh, about the platypus and how the animals had sort of forgotten their true names and totems and there was chaos. And, um, and then at the end uh, it was the ancient platypus, the oldest and wisest of all beings that reminded the animals of their true names and totems and their rightful relationship with each other and the land so that peace and harmony could be restored. And Uncle Eric knew about permaculture because some of my PDC graduates had actually been working up on their community and he felt that that's very much what permaculture is about. It's helping people to reconnect back with their place in nature and their relationship with um, with you know all beings and uh, so he felt that that was an appropriate name for a permaculture education centre. It's more than appropriate isn't and, it? And uh, it's just we carry that with incredible sort of you know pride and humility and a deep sense of responsibility to honour that. Yeah mm. it's a wonderful story. Mm. The other part of it is of course the, the relearning of the names and one of the stories you mentioned over lunch um, to do with the birch tree. If, uh, I know yeah. the listeners would, would mm. and viewers for the video people yeah. would, uh, if you'd like to tell that, because that is we've been talking about that kind of stuff and and, and uncovering, mm. uh, un uncovering and relearning various heritages and lineages, and, yeah. and because the, the interconnectedness extends to um, how we think with and about the wider world, doesn't it? Well, the interconnectedness connectedness is not just sort of horizontal here and now it's also past and future mm. and uh, it was largely through teaching you know patterns in human culture and how information was passed on through song and ceremony and symbol and um, stuff in in pre-literate societies and one day I thought, well, what about my heritage? You know, I'm giving all these examples from Solomon Islands and North American Indians and Australian Aboriginals. What's mine? And so that got me um, researching my Celtic roots and uh, then making it relevant to, you know, living in Australia here in the Southern Hemisphere. So 
Sorry, it's just uh, switched off. Uh, Do it again. Oh, we could, yeah. Mm. Yeah. There you go. Uh, so, uh, and making it relative to uh, living here in the, the Southern Hemisphere because uh, all this stuff really has arisen. All our cultures have arisen out of our intimate relationship with the nature around us that provides for our needs. And uh, all our art, all our music, our language, our stories, I mean, it's all, that's, it's, that's, it's grounded in that connection with our environment. Uh, but I'm not in a Northern European environment here. Uh, so I uh, went through the process of transposing it all to the Southern Hemisphere and I tried to also make it very practical uh, for you know, myself and for others and made the Celtic Eightfold Year chart. And, um, um, and here on Janbang I've sort of created a little uh, acknowledgement of that cultural heritage and planted some of the sacred uh, trees and shrubs that um, the Ogams and the Lunar Months were named after that can cope with our climate yeah. and one of them is the birch and uh, Uncle Eric and Auntie Yuna were visiting here in 97 and uh, I showed them they wanted me to take them for a tour around and we got to the circle and I explained what it was and Auntie Yuna said oh, can you tell me about one of these plants and so I talked about the birch tree and how it's the uh, the first month of the lunar calendar and so it represents new beginnings and when you see the birch trees growing they're the pioneers of a new forest and and uh, you know and then you've got the medicinal side of it you've got the craft side you've got the there's all this information that's sort of bound up with the birch and the symbol of the birch or the birkana or and um, she just went wow she said thank you so much um, it was a very important moment for her because she had Irish ancestors her, I think her grandmother was Irish and uh, she could uh, never relate to that part of her heritage and I think a lot of people sort of feel that pain indigenous people that mm. have got mixed blood they just can't relate to that other uh, culture or, or you know heritage that uh, they, they carry and um, it was immensely healing for her she says look it's just like curry culture and uh, now I feel whole instead of being split in half it's so good. Yeah. It's so good. Uh, and, uh, it's it's so important that we understand our own heritage, our own traditions, because they've, you know, that's what's brought us to here. It has. It yeah. absolutely has. Do you think is, is that something permaculture is by and large good at? Do you think that's a shortcoming? Um, well, it's something that Bill was good at, mm -hmm. and you know, if you really read. Uh, like this, that section on patterns and that little tiny segment in the designer's manual on science and a thousand names of God. Um, Bill was very in touch with that. But I think a lot of people just don't, you know, it, it just, they, 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 it doesn't compute. Mm -hmm. They're sort of more obsessed with just sort of like the physical environment, the plants, the animals, the buildings, the technology, and the earthworks, and how all that interconnects. And um, I think you know, a lot of the these other nuances in permaculture that were, you know, a really big part of you know Bill's thinking um, have been missed by a lot of people. Mm. Mm. To some sense, I, this is a weird way of describing it, is that almost by design? Uh, there's some... I'll, I'll give you an example from psychology, right? So, Freud was, in fact, very interested in things like telepathy and, and, and psi and mm -hmm. so on. He performed telepathy um, experiments with his daughter and, and yep. so on. He just didn't talk about it. He didn't talk about it because he was trying to get 
psychology and psychotherapy to be yeah. considered serious. Mm. Um, which some days I view as a betrayal. Some days I think maybe he should have been a bit bolder about it. Yeah. Um, kind of the same thing with Jung and his Red Book, right? Mm. And there's a kind of I, I get a sense of that sometimes with Bill in particular. I never met him, but like I've read mm. as much of his stuff as I can. Look. That he's trying to get it to be. He, 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 yeah, he did sort of focus on the science. There was another side to Bill. Um, and I say he brings that into some of his writings. But um, also, like, especially through the 80s, you get the emergence of what I call spew age. Yes, of course. Okay, and so it's sort of like this fake spirituality. It's this fake so much stuff where people are just sort of consuming and assuming uh, stuff from other cultures and isms and, 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 and so on to fill their own uh, void and um, and Bill uh, was very vocal against what he called woo-woo stuff mm. and um, and he wanted permaculture to have a wide reach and a wide appeal because it needs to you know and uh, not to just sort of become um, uh, something that is an add-on to crystal healing mm. or uh, yep. you know things like that. Uh, so he was quite vocal about about sort of woo stuff because he had a, a very sensitive what we call a BS radar and um, and things like that would just you know sort of get him to, look the natural world. Is just so amazing. We don't need, you know, woo-woo stuff. And we're all interconnected, you know. And our interconnection is our immortality. We don't need afterlives. We're all immortal anyway, because everything in our body will exist forever. It's just going to transform. It's already transforming every time we eat. It's transforming every time we breathe. It's transforming. You know, I'm the the. the I'm intimate, um, we're intimately part of this tree and this tree is part of us simply because we're both breathing you know the tree is photosynthesizing it's pumping out the oxygen that we're breathing now we're talking and breathing out the CO2 that it's taking in and everything is just in is cycling and it's um, you, you don't need belief systems You've just got to open your eyes and accept the wholeness of it all. And it's just the magic of life. Mm. Huh? Yeah, sure. Yeah. And that was Bill deep down. But uh, he didn't want to talk about that too much because then people would just sort of grab onto little bits and turn it into some new woo-woo thing. Mm. So how, how does that, because I, I agree, and I think he probably made the mm. right decision. It's a similar decision mm. to the one Freud made, right? Um, what do we do with that now? It doesn't matter. What do we, what do we do with that now? Because here's where I'm. I'm writing an article for a, mm. a, a book that a friend of mine, Dr. Jack Hunter, is is um, putting together on mm. greening the paranormal, because we we have about 120 years of of scientific evidence that. Mm. The, the things that used to be considered woo-woo in fact work, like sending intentions mm. into plants and that other kind of classic, like talking to plants, they um, they perform better. It's not necessarily that, but we have, we have information that's now inarguable that the role of a human in a system mm. extends beyond physical activity. Yeah. So I don't think permaculture's... I don't know what permaculture does to incorporate that because if it works, it needs to be incorporated mm. in. And I don't know how we get through that without the woo-woo risk. Yeah, well, um, I think, you know, it's, we could, that's a really big question. Yes, it we is. we could talk for a long time <laughs> about. Uh, but um, I think a lot is also about how you teach permaculture. I think just even teaching patterns in nature, patterns in culture, I mean that opens people right mm. up. And I find with like the PDC, I, I teach many other courses but I do have a special spot for the PDC. I think it's an amazing um, experience, learning experience and life experience that a lot of people come through. And I get people that are coming from a very hard science, you know, sort of um, physical 
environmental perspective and it really opens up their minds and hearts to uh, a different sort of connection with nature and I get people that are totally woo-woo that come in and it actually grounds and practicalizes them mm -hmm. and so I think if we can sort of hold that space and and there's I mean there's peripheral things that we delve into I mean we don't really have time in a PDC to go making cob ovens or to you know do uh, a lot of I mean every aspect of permaculture you could then expand into another uh, sort of two-week dissertation sure. um, and so uh, I think that's uh, something that is very much uh, cultural mm -hmm. and uh, the perspectives that might sort of fit in with say you know, Hindu India might be very different to what fits in with the uh, thinking and the vocabulary of uh, Taoists in China or Taiwan or, you know, will be different again for, you know, I've got a wonderful graduate who set up a permaculture institute in Java and uh, he's a, a Sufi, he follows the Sufism, which is the more mystical sure. path of Islam and uh, so uh, his institute is focusing on bringing in Muslim people and just opening their minds and hearts up uh, that much more and giving them that very practical permaculture stuff within that framework so uh, I think you know there are many paths mm. there are many ways there are many philosophies but you, know, you just look at hard science and we now know that plants have got 15 senses that we don't have. Mm. That uh, they hear, they um, communicate with each other underground and with chemicals from their leaves. They uh, give out this horrendous chemical scream when we, you know, cut them or pick them or bite into them. And um, everything's alive, everything's interconnected. And so. You know, more and more, uh, I think we're starting to find that science is resonating uh, with a lot of the essence of, or, or we could almost call it the science, of um, ancient and indigenous mm. cultures. Oh, absolutely. Mm. Love that stuff. It's such good medicine permaculture. I mean, it, as you can say, it kind of, it, it interacts um, situation is as, as well it should uh, and in a context. And I guess the last question, I mean, this is was really inspirational to be here um, while um, you guys are running a course that is somewhat unique, or at least I mm. haven't heard of before. Mm. Would you um, like to tell people what you can about what's going on in there? Because I think that's an unbelievably good news permaculture story. Yeah, well, we've got our standard PDC, but it's being run a little differently as a bilingual course. So half the class are um, some native English-speaking people, and half the class are uh, Chinese and uh, eight of them have actually come from uh, China from Shenzhen and uh, they're all members of a design team working on uh, a big new urban project there that will house 20,000 people and the company uh, that they uh, work for, uh, Taihua, uh, they've actually been hosting PDCs over in Shenzhen for the last five years that I've been co-teaching with uh, Hui Cheng from uh, Taiwan. Uh, but uh, for this project they wanted to send the whole team out to get trained here and after the PDC we'll be doing a five-day workshop uh, specifically on how we can then bring permaculture thinking principles, productivity and so on into this, this um, massive project. Massive? It's 20,000 people? Yes. Yeah. So a, 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 a Chinese company has flown out their entire design team to get their PDCs and then have a five-day consult as to how to use permaculture design back in China to house mm. 20,000 people in an urban context. Yeah. I think that's amazing. I think that's is, one of the most it amazing. It is really it is exciting. The, it's <laughs> mid-January, but it's, yeah. that doesn't matter. This is still the best thing I've heard this year. Yeah. I think that's <laughs> such a cool story. Like, congratulations. Mm. I mean, mm. that's such a... a it seems, I hope it happens more, but that's such yeah. a feather in the cap to be like, yeah. it's finally And it's going to be out. right in the heart of the CBD, 
uh, right next door to a great big glitzy shiny mall and and, and, and monument to consumerism. That's so good. And there's a, this beautiful green throbbing heart next to it of um, green vertical towers <laughs> of, <laughs> of uh, sort of a. Um, they're looking at each sort of tower being its own village, you know, um, a vertical eco villages. Just and the uh, whole of life cycle, sort of our aged housing, kindergarten, the stormwater will be going into an artificial lake and uh, there'll be vertical greening and rooftop gardens and we'll be looking at bioclimatic design for the buildings and yeah, it's uh, very exciting. So it's mm. just, it seems like science fiction sitting here, but it's not, it's actually happening. It's just wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Well, Robin, um, thank you so much for your time. This yeah. was such a good chat. For people who are listening and watching, uh, if they want to know more about yourself, where do they find your various things online? That okay, kind of thing? Uh, my web, our website is permaculture.com.au and you'll also uh, find us on Facebook so uh, Permaculture College Australia and myself Robin Francis mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. absolutely all right well again thank you so much and thank you for inviting us to this amazing place um, I, I love these discussions you're an inspiration so it's it's really wonderful to hear this I, I just bought five acres the same amount and I have platypus in my river oh, southern lovely. Tasmania so Yay. slightly different um, species assembly but mm. it's just this is um, there's some parallels yeah and yeah. this like I'm, I'm just into it this is what uh, I can consider a goal <laughs> Yay. yeah all right well thank you it's been most enjoyable thank you very much hmm.